sure. Let me uh, I need to make sure I got a working clicker. Okay. And, then, uh, and that's right down there as well, right in front of you. Okay, great. Thank you. If everyone could take their seats, we would appreciate it. Thanks. So uh, welcome to the last uh, Ask With Forum of the year. Uh, woo! <laughs> um, I'm hoping that that's enthusiasm about Ask With Forums, not enthusiasm about it being the last uh, Ask With Forum of the year. Um, and particular thanks to uh, all the students who are here uh, in the midst of uh, finals. Uh, the panelists uh, really appreciate your desire to come out and see and participate in this event uh, in the midst of uh, other things going on. Um, so this is a panel on uh, transforming teaching. Uh, if anyone here is on Twitter, uh, the hashtag for the panel is transforming teaching. And if there is an interesting discussion going on on Twitter while we are talking, we will post it up there so that everybody can, uh, can jump in. Um, so the basic plan for today is uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers present briefly uh, a vision of what it might look like to transform teaching. Then we're going to have a discussion for about 45 minutes till about 6.30 uh, for what that, um, how the panelists think we might be able to get from here to there. And then we'll have half an hour for uh, Q&A from the audience. All right. Um, so we're uh, very uh, lucky to be joined uh, by Tony Brake, Jeff Duncan Andrade, and Wendy, Randy Weingarten. You really could not have three better people with whom to talk about this uh, particular topic. Uh, Tony Brake, do you want to just kind of wave? Or? <laughs> uh, is the president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Uh, my notes say, and Tony, I don't know where this came for it. Before that, he was an esteemed professor at Stanford University. I don't know if that's uh, in the official bio. Uh, and before that, professor of urban education at the University of Chicago. Uh, and before that, uh, Tony was also a professor here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, which uh, for the doctoral students, he and Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, uh, who is also uh, in the audience, uh, taught a, a very uh, surely rigorous and varied um, foundations course for doctoral students, which uh, remains a, a legend and something for the rest of us to try to live up to uh, to this day. Um, while at Chicago, Tony founded uh, the Center for Urban School Impro Improvement and the Consortium on Chicago Schools Research, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. He's a member of the National Academy of Education and was appointed by President Obama to the National Board for Education Sciences in 2010. Uh, he's written a number of books. Um, some of you may know Catholic Schools and the Common Good, uh, which was about the way in which um, values and mission held together Catholic schools and created uh, identity. Um, and then more recently, his work on trust uh, and organizing schools for improvement is uh, pretty much a Bible in the field. Uh, and then the last five years or so, he's been at Carnegie uh, working on ideas around uh, networked improvement communities and improvement science, ways of uh, bringing together researchers and practitioners to uh, work to solve problems together. Uh, and he'll tell you more about that uh, as he talks. Uh, Jeff Duncan Andrade is Associate Professor of Raza Studies and Education Administration and Interdisciplinary Studies at San Francisco State University. Uh, Jeff has the uh, rare distinction of, uh, for 22 years, being a practice, practicing English teacher as well as a member uh, now of the San, San Francisco State uh, faculty. Uh, he works closely with te teachers, school site leaders, and school district officials nationally and as far abroad as Brazil and New Zealand to help them develop classroom practices and school cultures that foster self-confidence, esteem, and academic success among uh, all students. Uh, he's recently completed two books, The Art of Critical Pedagogy, Possibilities for Moving from Theory to Practice in Urban Schools, and What a Coach Can Teach a Teacher. Um, and I will tell you also um, that um, when some of our students found out that Jeff was going to be here today, uh, they were just kind of uh, overjoyed. Um, there is a critical need for voices like uh, Jeff's in this space and particularly uh, at this campus. Um, and so uh, we're really lucky to have him here uh, today and uh, you're going to hear why uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Randy Weingarten is the president of the 1.6 million, do not dollar, uh, 1.6 million member uh, AFT-AFL-CIO, which rep represents teachers, paraprofessionals, 
and school-related personnel, as well as higher ed faculty, nurses, healthcare professionals, local and state and federal government employees, and early childhood educators. Before that, she served for 12 years as the president of the UFT in New York, representing approximately 200,000 educators. Uh, in 2013, the New York Observer named Weingarten as one of the most influential New Yorkers of the past 25 years. Um, she served on the uh, Equity and Excellence Commission, which our own Dean Jim Ryan also served on, trying to uh, put forward a more uh, robust set of proposals for how we could move forward with public education. Uh, she, uh, under her leadership, the AFT released a report raising the bar, arguing that um, initial teachers uh, required uh, higher levels of certification uh, and has frequently been called a later day uh, Al Shanker in her uh, progressive leader, progressive leading of the AFT. So uh, you are in good hands uh, with these three. I will just try to ask some questions and uh, get out of the way. Um, this panel is part of a project which I had called the Building Expertise in uh, Teaching Project. Uh, and the goal of the project is to uh, see what it would take to build a system whereby uh, each student uh, had an opportunity to be uh, taught by a high quality uh, teacher, um, pretty much from the years uh, teachers entered the workforce through the years uh, in which they uh, retired. I think it's helpful to sort of think about this a little bit in a historical frame. Um, teaching uh, in this country was initially a field for uh, unmarried women uh, who taught until they um, had a child and left the labor force. Uh, and teaching as a field uh, still bears that legacy. People don't think of it as a highly skilled uh, expert kind of job, though as any of you who have tried it uh, know, uh, it certainly is. Uh, many top education schools, in including this one, uh, didn't want to touch teacher uh, education for a long time because it, uh, it contaminated them as being associated with low status issues like pedagogy and instead focused on uh, leadership and administration. Um, and um, then uh, starting around uh, 1960, uh, two things changed. Um, one, um, a move for uh, equity made it so that um, um, many more students were being asked we, the system was asked to give many more students the kind of education that had uh, previously been reserved for um, a few privileged, uh, mostly white students. And the economy changed, uh, making demands uh, in terms of what everyone needed to know and be able to do that far exceeded what they had uh, previously uh, needed. But in that situation, the system that we never built uh, really came back to haunt us in the sense that um, there were not established ways for significant and careful teacher training. There weren't ways of developing uh, knowledge that uh, was useful for teaching. Uh, there wasn't a political coalition that said, uh, if we just distribute the best of the teachers we have to the most advantaged uh, districts and suburbs, that that's not okay. Um, and so now we're at a moment where uh, uh, we're trying to um, remedy that situation and to build a system that we never had. We had an interesting discussion today about whether we have essentially a non-system or whether we have a system that's designed to produce exactly the result that it gets, namely that uh, certain students get a first class education and many students do not. Uh, but one way or another, uh, there's a big set of challenges ahead of us uh, in terms of turning teaching into uh, the kind of field that many people would aspire to that created opportunities for teachers to grow and learn. Um, in the white paper for which you have the link in the handout we gave you, uh, we argue that there's sort of sort of three missing systems of which you're gonna, you can see two on this slide. Uh, one relates to the kind of work we do here at the Ed School and is done in practice. Um, and that's that uh, most fields uh, have what you could think of as a sort of uh, research and development system, a system where uh, people uh, both research but also develop knowledge that's useful for practice. Uh, there's a mechanism for vetting that knowledge. Uh, lots of, there's a lot of practical knowledge out there. Almost every problem has been solved by some teacher somewhere. But that knowledge is basically invisible to uh, the teaching profession as a whole. There are also uh, more uh, teachers who think that they have good ideas than there really are good ideas. So how would we know which of those ideas are good and which ones are not? Uh, and how would we know uh, among researchers, how would we know what sorts of ideas didn't just pass peer review and other researchers think they were good ideas, but how would we know that that knowledge was actually useful for teaching? 
Uh, where are the intermediaries? Uh, what, if you're a teacher, like how would you keep up in a reasonable way with whatever knowledge is being uh, discovered? And then how would all of that sort of feed back into a loop so that the questions that teachers are asking about their practice would inform the questions that researchers were asking? And then related to that, you know, knowledge wouldn't do you much good without a me mechanism for teachers to learn it and put it into practice. Uh, and that would require a uh, change on a for sort of more familiar set of dimensions. So it would require teacher training that was more clinically oriented, more based in practice, uh, with more um, high quality mentor teachers. It would require uh, professional development that didn't violate all of the principles of adult learning. Uh, and actually were connected to ongoing work and learning that uh, teachers were doing in schools. It would require school-based communities, which were uh, not just sort of the cliche of learning organizations or data-driven organizations, but places where there was a culture in which people could learn, experiment, fail, try, et cetera. Uh, and this continuum would be anchored by master teachers, people who had uh, moved through this continuum and then had a lot of knowledge they wanted to share. These could be the people who were developing model lessons, uh, providing uh, apprenticeship style training to newcomers. Uh, all Everything that I've said, there's somebody doing somewhere, but as a sort of woven together system, it's not there. Um, I presented it before uh, for simplicity's sake as sort of two uh, rows, but really you should think about these things as uh, iterative. So the knowledge cycle should be iterative and teaching should have its own life cycle from sort of birth through uh, master teachers for those who choose to take it. And then all of this would need to be uh, anchored by a policy ecosystem. The policy ecosystem is what would pay for this. Uh, if you wanna do a uh, high quality residency, that means that half of the time in which a first year teacher is currently teaching, they would be learning. So who's gonna pay for that and where's the political will gonna come uh, to support that? Uh, the policy ecosystem would need to support differentiated roles. Um, the policy ecosystem would need to build political will. There are sort of a number of elements here. And then most fundamentally, uh, the policy ecosystem would need to do two things. It would need to orient around a kind of modern purpose of education. What do we want students to learn? Uh, how would we know, um, what do we want them to be able to do as well as what would they know? Um, what are the sort of range of skills and competencies that we want for our children? Uh, and how could that sort of set of anchors around student learning anchor the kind of learning we would want uh, for teachers? And then the other, the other is the kind of original sin of America and of American education, which is basically an offshoot of the original sin of America, which is um, race, uh, and class and the way in which the inequalities that we have are not an accident but are essentially sort of baked into the DNA. So who is going to uh, confront uh, those uh, inequalities, uh, build on the assets we have in communities, change reforms from reforms done to teachers to reforms done with teachers uh, and communities. So that's a sort of a short kind of synopsis of the kinds of things that we wanna talk about today. Uh, and the reason that we put some uh, design challenges on your chair is that these are things that um, w not only are we working on, these are things that we think that the sort of field as a whole should be working on. So if part of the core problem, just to take one of the things I said, is that you know some teachers know certain things that it would be nice for other teachers to know. Teachers contain both the supply and the demand for that problem. The question is just creating some sort of online community or in-person community where people could share that. So. Uh, we definitely invite your uh, ideas uh, and action in moving towards uh, these things. And with that, I'll invite our panelists uh, to the stage. So uh, welcome, uh, as best as possible. I'd like to sort of treat this like a conversation. Feel free to talk to each other uh, as well as to me and the audience. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, a good place to start is uh, with your assessment of kind of where we are today and where we might go. Um, so um, Randy, maybe we could start with you. Uh, what do you see as the most important uh, two to three things that we need to do to make 
uh, teaching the kind of field we would like it to be. How about everybody getting through their exams? <laughs> um, I actually think we need to do two things, and I'm, um, we were, Jeff and I were talking before, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that the era of teaching bashing, teacher bashing is coming to a close, but we are now at a now what moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's two big anchors. One, there is the professional anchor, and second, or two big foundational blocks, let me call it, instead of an anchor. One is the professional foundational block, and the second is the financial foundational block. Um, I think on the financial, um, it's, it's probably obvious, but teaching needs to be a middle class profession. It is in Finland. There's a big difference in Finland, South Korea, and here in most of the OECD countries where, um, where we're seeing um, the kind of inroads we've seen. It is, but it isn't here. And there's a whole bunch of things to do, but I think we need to really think about how to make it not a middle class bonus system, but a middle class profession. That's number one. And I also think that that will help us in terms of diversity um, hugely, which we need to work on. Um, number two, though, is something that I think a lot of people probably in this room have talked about a lot, and Tony talks about it all the time, which is the notion of how do we create the conditions of a profession. And I would actually put um, them into two categories. One is what I often talk about as the T words, um, but it starts with you have to create a trusting collaborative environment. There's lots of different ways to do that, but you need to, schools need to be places where parents want to send their kids, teachers want to work, kids are engaged, and it has to create a climate of trust, not just people um, going into their um, rooms and closing the door and hoping nobody shows up except for their kids. But the second is the whole notion of not just trust, but these are the T words I use, tools, time, tenacity, the ability to try teamwork. And, 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 we, and that is the kind of attributes of other professions that we need to have baked into this profession bottom up. Great. Uh, Jeff, uh, what do you think? Um, well, I just want to start by um, just asking permission um, from the ancestors to speak and just acknowledge um, the space that we're in, um, and that this is um, native land, um, and um, acknowledge the Massachusetts and the Algonquin um, first. Um, and I think um, on that uh, same uh, track, for me, the first, it, it's about purpose and process. And I think that there is, I, I find that virtually no debate um, locally or nationally about the purpose of public schools in this country. Um, and, and I think that if we do not have some serious, first of all, that's, that's, it's profoundly ahistorical, right? Um, to, uh, to pretend that we're gonna address what's going on uh, with teachers and with schools without acknowledging the fact that um, the foundation of public schools, the historical foundation of public schools in this country is rotten. Um, and you know nobody uh, that buys a house um, starts putting up double pane windows and a new roof and buys new furniture uh, and a new stove without first checking the foundation. Because if you don't, if the foundation isn't solid, then all the investments that you make in these other things end up being wasted investments. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with why we're spinning our wheels so much around this issue in, in the US. Um, because if you look historically at the, at the how public schools were founded, then you understand it, precisely why we are where we are, right? Precisely why teachers are so devalued. Um, so for me, um, that's, that's the first piece that I think we may need to make a much deeper investment in over time nationally is to have some serious debate and conversation about why do we even have public schools in this country? What, what is the purpose? Um, and, then, uh, and, and then if we have some, some serious conversation around that, then, then I think the other piece that we need to take on um, 
is the process by which um, people come into this work. Okay? And, and when I think about the process, I think about it as the, the sort of holy trinity of teaching. Um, and, and I feel like we do all three badly. Okay, so um, who gets recruited, when they get recruited, how they get recruited um, is highly ineffective. Um, then even when we do get recruiting right, right, then they end up in a pre-service program, right, tr training um, that doesn't prepare them for the reality of being in the classroom, particularly if they're being sent to uh, schools that are serving the nation's most vulnerable youth and communities. So we do pre-service uh, work poorly. And then if we get that right, and then they get into schools, they're not well supported. Um, there's, and, and we all know the national data on the lever rate for the first two, three years of teachers. Um, because the professional culture and structure isn't there to really support teachers to develop a lifelong career as a classroom educator. And so for me, the, the, the problem becomes then that we have these conversations uh, as silos, right? So somebody's working on teacher recruitment and somebody else is working on uh, teacher credentialing and somebody else is working on professional development support over time and they end up actually running into each other a lot. And so what I would like to see in the process side um, is uh, a, a much more integrated conversation across those three sectors to make sure that what I experience in my recruiting is then uh, supported and aligned with how I'm trained pre-service and then what I actually learn in my pre-service program, I get to do that in classrooms, right? So as one example, you, you got students all over the country uh, reading Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and then they go into schools and, and they're told they can't do critical pedagogy. And, and so that, that disconnect, I think, um, circles me back to um, th the purpose, right? And because we don't have a clear um, sensibility about what the purpose of public schools is in this country, um, then I think we, um, we keep misaligning the ways in which we try and bring teachers into it. Mm -hmm. Tony? Uh, simple question. Uh, let me then just start by just saying, I've, over the course of my lifetime, I spent a lot of time, a lot of hours in this room. Uh, my introduction, Joff forgot to mention that I, I actually did my doctoral studies here at HGSE and spent many, many days teaching over in the basement of Larson Hall with, with Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, which is, remains the kind of really the really bright spot in my career. Um, I think there's extraordinary dynamism in the field right now. Uh, we have a lot of people working very hard on trying to make our schools better. And if you know, kind of looking at data over a period of time, uh, schools are gradually getting somewhat better. Uh, particularly if you look at recent data on high school dropouts, high school dropout rate has substantially declined. Hardly anyone makes much of a story about it, but that is no small accomplishment. The problem, the problem is that our, in my view, is that our aspirations mm -hmm. for what we want our schools mm -hmm. to accomplish yeah. are now e increasing at a very rapid rate, way beyond what ordinary people working within the tools and knowledge and systems that they've been asked to work in uh, are able now to routinely deliver. And that chasm is growing and the chasm is greatest for our most disadvantaged students and our most disadvantaged communities. And if we keep doing what we've always been doing, mm -hmm. there's very little reason to believe that that chasm will close. And so part of the work that I've been engaged in over the last uh, half dozen years has really been taking on this challenge about how do we go about learning to improve? How is the system can we get better at getting better? Because it's not a shortage of people. It, it's certainly not, it, it is certainly that we have a lot of people working very hard. It's not a shortage of good ideas, but we can't seem to get those ideas to actually work effectively at any kind of scale. We get little pockets of it here and there. Uh, and it, there is a 
kind of irony about this because one of the things we've also learned over the last 15 years is we've begun to see the power of networks, large networks that are able to, that are able to innovate, that are able when properly structured for ideas to, do, to move very rapidly from place to place, to get tested, to get refined uh, by others, um, and to accelerate learning. Well, education is the quintessential large network. We have millions of people, literally millions of people, doing highly related work every day. We could get much better, faster, if we figured out different ways of learning together how to improve. And so this, this well, John will have that up here. What would an R&D infrastructure look like that really put the core practices of teaching and learning and the institutions in which this occurs at the center of what we're trying to accomplish? That, I think, is, is a critical part of the, of the enterprise going forward. So let's just pick up on that last point, Tony, that you made, which is um, that the challenge is sort of in the way that you're framing it is to sort of reliably get a number of ideas that are working in particular places to work uh, in a sort of deeper way uh, in, in, more, in more places. Um, tell us a little bit about sort of you've developed a series of tools that sort of help us do those things like what are those tools? What have we learned from what they can do? Are there limits to those tools? Just tell us a little bit about your work around trying to solve that problem. Well, we, we've, we've organized this, tried to organize this work around what we call the six core principles of improvement. The first of which it starts with being problem specific. What is the specific problem we're trying to solve? Uh, we tend to have very broad societal ambitions eventually got to bring this down to the work that people are doing and what is actually impeding them from accomplishing that work. So that means getting down into the actual details and seeing it through the perspective of those who are doing the work. So we're talking about student learning, seeing the experience of schooling through the eyes of students, not through what we intend, mm -hmm. but through what they actually experience. If we're talking about how to help new teachers get better at what they're doing, seeing it through their lens rather than through the variety of programs that we might, that we might develop a principle to support them, but often don't cohere mm -hmm. at the site of, at which they actually work. So problem specific and user centered. The second of which is variation in performance is the problem to solve. That we have lots of ideas about different kinds of programs, things we should do. Uh, but for virtually anything we might try to accomplish, there's almost as much variability within this innovative idea as there is in the people who never were exposed to it. So to really focus attention on the sources of variability and performance. Why is it that disadvantaged students, minority students, students from families where neither parent has had a post-secondary education, we routinely know they're much less likely to succeed. Uh, so really understanding to get at the sources of that variability goes to the third principle. You have to see the system that creates it. The, uh, we tend to pay a lot of attention to the outcomes we want, and we're very good at thinking about solutions, things we ought to add, but we rarely focus attention on how this all, how all the pieces fit together, interact to support improving teaching and learning. And the, the silos uh, concept that, that Jeff was talking about before is, is, is central to that. Uh, the fourth one, in some part, the most difficult one, I think, for a lot of educators, is it comes directly out of the work on quality improvement. You can't improve at scale mm -hmm. what you cannot measure. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a subtlety to this principle. We have a lot of data on student outcomes now, and we've become very good at slicing and dicing these data in a variety of ways, and so we can see the variation in performance quite well. Uh, but if you really want to improve systems, you've got to start to get data down at the level at which people, teachers or students, are actually doing the work. And at that process level, we tend to have a dearth of information coming back. So absent that kind of information feedback, we can continue to hold ideas about what we think are good for educational systems and 
there's no opportunity for the data to object, to actually challenge our ideologies and, and so on. Fifth one is, is we gotta bring discipline and inquiry into this work. And this is sort of a very simple idea. It goes back to what's the specific problem you're trying to solve? What change are you gonna introduce and why are you introducing it? And how would you know whether or not that change is actually an improvement? Because uh, if you're doing this kind of work, uh, we, have to, we have to believe in the power of what we're trying to accomplish. And that belief creates a very strong influence on our thinking. Psychologists refer to it as confirmation bias. We tend to see what we believe in. And so mm -hmm. if we don't, if we're not very disciplined in the way we move ideas out, and try them out, we will often be misled by our beliefs. It's just human nature. And then the last of the principles is this idea of accelerating learning through, through networks. We can now see the power of networks and it's in our grasp. We just need to organize ourselves to take advantage of it. So Jeff, I know you've been doing a lot of uh, work with uh, teachers and schools uh, with a kind of design-oriented kind of mindset. Um, in what ways do you see what you're doing is similar to what Tony described? In what ways do you think that what you're doing is, is different? Uh, tell us a little bit about that work and if you could relate it a little to what Tony just said. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we started something uh, three years ago now called the Teaching Excellence Network. Um, and because in our field you're mandated to have acronyms, uh, it's 10. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so we started 10 uh, three years ago. Um, we're That's now good. working with uh, schools and teachers in nine different states and internationally with uh, Maori schools in New Zealand. Um, and it really is, uh, I mean, th this idea was, was uh, birthed out of um, me being in the classroom for 20 years uh, in, in Oakland and, uh, and being able to count on um, part of one hand the number of really meaningful PDs that I got in my school. And so we, uh, myself and, and uh, some of my colleagues, decided that we would create the um, PD system we always wished we had. Um, and, um, and what we found is, is there's so much hunger, for, there's so much hunger for what um, Tony's describing in uh, amongst teachers. Right? Yeah. There's so much desire to be a badass teacher, um, but there's so little infrastructure, and so the so what was I, I love that he called me that. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> you got to use the acronym. Exactly. Um, so uh, what what we found if, when we started working with teachers was um, was was a just this tremendous appetite, right, for the opportunity to be um, part of um, a network of teachers that was um, doing these things that Tony was just talking about, having serious inquiry, uh, working in the power of networks, understanding, you know, look, every problem that a teacher is currently grappling with in a classroom right now, there is some other teacher in this country yes. that grappled with that problem and has unlocked it. And right now, there is no way for them to connect, right? Which is absurd. So we started 10 really as a way to say that, um, that there's, we can use the infrastructure of technology to start allowing teachers to connect to other teachers and allow teachers to teach other teachers. You know, the one thing teachers really like to do? Teach, right? And we don't just like teaching kids. We just like teaching. And we'll teach our asses off, and you don't got to pay us anymore to teach other teachers, because the other thing teachers really love is teachers, right? And so if we, all we've really done, right, is to create um, a fairly simple infrastructure to, to bring to teachers um, that kind of space where they can begin to work with the person across the hall, with the person s six blocks down in another school, with the person... Uh, 60 miles away that's in their state and and to really start thinking about these concentric circles of support um, so that no teacher ever leaves a classroom at the end of the day and 
doesn't have a place to connect to other teachers to start a sharing how dope they are right? and or b and or b sharing the things that they're really grappling with this profession i'm speaking now as a 20-year vet of the classroom it is incredibly isolating it is incredibly isolating okay. and um and, and that is a design flaw uh deliberate or not i think it's deliberate but um, that, um, that we can unlock pretty quickly um, because of how accessible technology is now. Hmm. Can I just, um, so I wonder if we could um, marry 10 with SML, with Share My Lesson, mm -hmm. which is the platform that we started. You know, we, we use some of the technology that our partners in, um, in Great Britain used, and I know that it's not always perfect, but what's interesting is that in two years' time, there are over 750,000 people who have joined it, um, about 1,000 people a day, and it's simply a sharing platform. Um, and you know, in, in SML 2.0, we're gonna try to make it more than that, more interactive, so that people can really communicate with each other in a much more interactive way. But it is, you can see the thirst of and the need for, for, for wanting to take those virtual, those walls down and create that kind of collaborative network. And I think, speaking of a design flaw, it also means that thinking about teacher accountability in a very different way. Mm -hmm. If we thought about teacher accountability not as um, fixated on individual accountability, but fixated on the kind of work that, that Tony just talked about, the kind of collaborative work, the kind of inquiry work, um, I think we would, we would start designing a different kind of system. Um, we would still have to deal with issues about you know, individual competence, but I think if we started thinking about it differently, um, we would be actually acting differently um, because that isolation is huge and the, the kind of quest for some ways of meaningfully building on each other's work, when you see that in a school, when you see people doing that, you see the kind of infantilization and isolation turn into empowerment. Mm -hmm. but, it, and I, but I would add quickly to that, though, that, that this would require a, a, a mindset shift sure. about how this nation right, feels about teachers, right? To, to actually treat teachers as learners and, and competent professionals, Absolutely. right? And to get, get all these folks' hands off our practice that couldn't do our job for a day, right? But that are quick to pass policy and initiatives and that we can tell you 90% of the shit that comes down the pipeline for me as a teacher, I can tell you the minute you hand it to me, that shit ain't gonna work. Gonna but work. Right. <laughs> but the other thing I would like to just go back to something Jeff said earlier, which is a shared understanding of what are the purposes of public education. Because I think that, and you, you get to something that both Tony and Jeff said, because if you are a classroom teacher these days, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a minute, um, but if you are a classroom teacher these days, you know, the first question becomes, okay, do I follow my instinct mm -hmm. about what I should be doing to help my children succeed? Mm -hmm. Or do I follow every single Tom, Dick, Harry, and everybody else's views about what I should be doing to help? Yeah. And, 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 and what am I gonna do today? Am I gonna follow the rules and the new 27 things that have been put on my plate? Or am I actually gonna follow what I think are my instincts? And the dilemma is, if we don't actually go back to some, or if we don't actually start with some kind of shared definition of what are the purposes of public education and what are the goals, what is success? Because right now, what we have defaulted to is success under the federal rules is what you've done on a math or English test score and whether kids have graduated from high school. That is really right now the only definition of success that counts in any way. What would it take to move to a broader definition of success? Um, I think you, I th well, let me, let me piggyback on what Jeff said. I think we have to actually start having a conversation about the purposes of public education. And we need to actually have that conversation, um, bottom up and top down. 
Um, and I think you need to have a conversation. And, and in my, you know, we have to be talking about the purposes. We have to be talking about pluralism. We have to be talking about democracy. We have to be talking about children's well-being. We have to be talking about all kids. We have to be talking about integration. We have to be talking about diversity as well as skills and knowledge. Um, and if we don't actually talk about how we're going to help create the um, um, an, a, a, a mechanism for kids to actually um, be able to not only dream their dreams but achieve them, and a mechanism for kids to actually participate, all kids participate in a thriving democracy that's pluralistic and which values kids as they are, um, then, and, and don't have a consensus around that, then we're never going to change an accountability system to be able to measure that, as Tony was saying before. So let's pick up on that um, pluralism point, right? Because one way you could imagine uh, aligning, aligning um, teaching across these various levels is around something common core state standards or something like it, right? We could have one set of standards, and those standards could organize what we expect for students, and that could anchor uh, teacher education, it could anchor teacher training, it could anchor PD, it could anchor what districts do, it could anchor the development of curriculum. That's sort of one vision of the world. Another vision of the world is we live in a very pluralistic country. The means and goals of education are highly contested. Uh, some kids go to Montessori, some kids go to very classical education, some kids go to Catholic school. Uh, there are lots of different ways to, to skin the cat and that it's possible that um, higher levels of the system should actually license networks to explore these different uh, possibilities. Um, Jeff, I know in your work, this isn't directly related to what I just said, I know in your work you have a sort of interesting way of uh, helping schools sort of think about what good teaching means for them. And I wonder if you could just sort of share a little bit about that. Sure, I, I think that one of the issues I have with all the these frameworks that are being developed to measure good teaching, um, and you know you can you can name them, you you know what they are. Um, even even in Oakland, where um, where we tried a, a, a fairly innovative model, where a group of teachers uh, and administrators got together and spent a couple of years designing. Uh, um, a teacher evaluation success framework just for Oakland. Right? But the problem with that is, is that what it implies is that school to school, excellent teaching means the same thing. Right. Okay? Good teaching isn't necessarily good teaching. So, you know, I, I live in the 3400 block of East Oakland, right? And if you looked at the demographics of, of my neighborhood and the demographics of a school uh, 15 blocks over in the north, in North Oakland, it looks pretty similar, okay. but the needs uh, in, in my community and the needs in North Oakland are, are somewhat different. And so when you apply this absolute framework, whether it's a, even a, a localized, a local developed framework like that, and you don't pay it, look, how long have we known that context matters? <laughs> so how the hell are you gonna use the same rubric across context when you know that, that context matters. So what we've done with 10 is to say, okay, before, before you start deciding what you're gonna give teachers feedback on, ask the damn community. Ask the families and the children and the teachers what's most important in this particular context, okay? So what, what we did is, is we took, we, we actually spent about 10 years just going through really the past four decades of research on highly effective teaching. Okay? And we looked at some of the most conservative stuff and some of the most progressive stuff and the stuff in the middle. And what we found was 52 recurring themes okay? across three domains, relationships, responsibility, and relevance. Okay? And, um, and these are things that keep popping up decade after decade. I mean, we act like we don't know what good teaching, we know. Okay? And, so we got these 52 things, and I'm not saying they're the absolute 52. I'm saying they're 52 things that are pretty widely agreed on. There's a couple wild cards in there. And then what we do is, is we go into a community, and we ask the families, and we ask the students, and we ask the teachers, of these 52, which do you think are the most important? And 
Then what you get is you get a context-specific set of targets for teachers, families, and kids to have dialogue about in that space. And then twice a year, teachers get feedback on the 52 gets reduced to 12. Okay. And then four per domain. And then twice a year, um, families, students, and colleagues give teachers feedback on how they're doing on those 12 things. Okay. And the other piece that's important, and the reason that we, Oakland, uh, and, uh, the district and the union actually asked us to use 10. Uh, they, were, they were bargaining their contract, and they asked us to use 10 as um, part of a pilot for their formal evaluation system. And so we did, and families loved it. Right? So many families said to us, this is the first time anybody's ever asked me what's important to me for my child. Right? That's so deep to me. Right? Uh, kids were saying, this is the first time anybody ever asked me what I want for my teachers. Teachers were saying, this is the first time anybody ever asked me what I know about what works here. Okay. So we piloted it as the formal evaluation tool for the district. Teachers loved it. Families loved it. Kids loved it. Even principals loved it. I challenge you, first of all, to find anything that you can get agreement across those four groups on. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the head of HR it pulled me into a, a room, a closet. And she said, I love what you guys are doing with 10, but I can't use this to fire anybody. Will you please exit the pilot? So we were literally pushed out of the pilot because our one rule is uh, when teachers get feedback, they control all their own data. And they, then they couldn't use it as a gotcha tool, right? And, and so I think this is a real tension that, that we're trying to unlock is do we want systems of evaluation for teachers or do we want systems of feedback and growth? Okay. Because right now those are at odds with each other. Now as I understand evaluation, right, it is all about, supposed to be all about growth, right? But back to our earlier point about how disrespected this profession is, as long as evaluation is not about feedback and growth, then we're in trouble right, a as a profession. And so we're trying to, again, use 10 to st start to um, kind of get in between, get a wedge in between that debate and say, actually, you can have both. Right? You can get really meaningful feedback and evaluation for teachers that actually helps them do what 99% of the profession wants to do, which is to kick ass. And uh, Tony, do you want to say something about how networked improvement communities think about context? Uh, when, we, when we talk about, when I talked about variation in performance as the problem to solve, one big source of variation in performance is context. <laughs> and uh, I've been going to meetings of the American Educational Research Association for almost 40, uh, <laughs> over 40 years. Good, too long. And and you know and I'm, we were going to say you weren't that old. Uh, I, I yeah he was very young. That's what they always used to say about <laughs> me back then. Um, uh, and I can't tell you how many sessions I've gone to where I've been a discussant on a session or a chair, and somebody's presenting a report on some program that's been implemented, uh, that's been tried out, and what we learn from this report is that, uh, well, uh, implementation really matters and it worked in some places and it didn't work in yeah, other just... places. And uh, that's, I mean, we should expect this variation in <laughs> performance. Uh, and so the problem, is, uh, the, the, we've got some of, this, some of this language that we're working within is actually really problematic. It's this what works language and the language of of the proven program. Mm -hmm. at, at best, what we learn from even the most rigorous field trial, a randomized control trial, comparing a program with some control condition, is that on average, maybe the program did a little better than the control condition, which means somebody benefited somewhere. Right. But typically, we don't know who, and we don't know in what context. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually after this goal about how do we get quality outcomes to occur reliably, and they hand it for lots of different subgroups of students working with varied kinds of teachers in different organizational conditions, that information 
doesn't help you very much. So the, it's not what works, but it's what works for whom under what set of conditions. And how do we actually organize a system of inquiry, broadly defined, that's actually about aiming at quality outcomes reliably at scale? That's the, that's the question we have to answer. And the what works question doesn't really take us in that direction. Okay. Which means that risk has to be, risk in some ways then has to be rewarded mm -hmm. and failure yeah. ha can't be tantamount with firing. Yeah. Because, and that's in some ways part of what's happened, I think we've gone a step backwards by tying so much of evaluation Sorry, Joel, to no, just no. jump in here. No, no. Just by tying so much of evaluation to student performance, separate and apart from you know whether test scores are reliable or accurate, even if you assume that they were, right. think about what it's now doing in terms of any of these systems about how you're you're going for what the test score is going to be, mm -hmm. as opposed even assuming it was reliable, which in most instances is not as opposed to going for what creates the ongoing improvement, what creates the relationship building, what creates the problem solving, what creates the critical thinking, what creates the tenacity. And, and so I think that what's happened, second design flaw, is that we've actually organized the whole humor, human resource endeavor as a gotcha system as opposed to an uh, improvement system. And, and I do think that we've, we've learned from, years, from the research years ago from peer review that even if you had an improvement system or, or a peer system, um, peers actually are far, um, are, are far higher critics or have far higher standards than this kind of top-down evaluation system. Uh, we, we, we built a system of gathering data about teaching what my quality improvement colleagues would say is around the 6% problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly right. Uh, right. That's from healthcare. I, I don't know what the right exact number is in education, but right. there is some small percentage of people who don't belong in classrooms, who shouldn't be running schools, and in some cases shouldn't be running districts. And we have a public responsibility to address this problem. But the issue of what do we do about to support the other 94% or whatever that number is. It's a big number. Yeah. And I, I sometimes ask people, well, do a, do a kind of thought experiment with me. If you were designing an information system whose principal purpose was to support the improvement of teaching, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it wouldn't take very long as you sketch this out to realize it doesn't bear much resemblance to what we're actually doing now because what we put in place was really designed to address the 6% problem, but now we're collecting all these data on all of these teachers, and so, well, now that we got it all, somehow we should use it to improve, but it wasn't designed for that purpose. It doesn't, it doesn't get to some of the critical uh, uh, points that Jeff and uh, concerns that, that um, that Jeff mentioned, mentioned before, and, and I truly believe we can get better at measuring the things we value in education. We just simply haven't tried. So that when, for example, when I did the work on Catholic schools and the common good, we had this idea about a school organized as a community. Well, what would it mean to talk Shocking. about a school organized as, as a community? community. And, and yeah, actually, you know, some Spending a lot of time talking to teachers, principals, and parents, um, looking at what it means to think about organizations that are that are communities. What sociological literature talks about as communities, uh, we were actually able to develop a set of indicators, things you could measure, and, and they actually make a difference. And the same thing was true about this kind of soft concept about relational trust. Um, it, yeah, we eventually we were able to, took a number of years, but we were eventually able to develop 20 questions. We could ask group of teachers, take about two and a half minutes, and depending upon how teachers in a school mm -hmm. responded to those 20 questions, 
they would affect by an order of magnitude, a factor of 10, how likely they were to improve over a seven year period of time in traditional indicators of reading mathematics, student attendance. Right. So we, my, my point is that we can get, we can measure th more than we've been attempting to, and we'd have better information to guide, you know, to push us toward the things we actually value. Mm -hmm. But so long as we're sort of fixated on a very narrow set of things that we count, uh, what we measure has become what we value. So let me just ask you all one more question and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, so I feel like if, if I were in the audience and I were listening to you, I might see a big disjuncture between the world that you're describing and the world that I was actually living in. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think specifically you would be right. <laughs> around the issue of culture. So you, you all are describing a kind of Durkheimian kind of gazelle shaft kind of world where people trust oh each other, they learn from one another, there's space for that, there are opportunities to fail, there's some unlearning, uh, and that's just normal human existence. That's the way people work with each other as they're trying to get uh, better at things. And they work in networks, they learn from other schools and so forth. But you know, schools sit in districts which sit within states, which sit within the federal government, those entities are not known for those qualities that I just uh, listed. Uh, they mainly make rules, and when you ask them why, they say that policy is a blunt hammer and this is what we can do. Uh, and they stymie a lot of the things which you have described. Uh, and so in the spirit of, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, uh, what do you agree with that diagnosis? And if so, kind of what can be done about it? The, the, only, the only thing I would say, Jal, I mean, I, I think your critical realist view of the system is, on, is uh, on target. But the ideas that we've been talking about, these are not pie in the sky ideas. Mm -hmm. right. When you look at high performing organizations across sectors and across countries, when you see them, they have these characteristics. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge is we need to think about policy differently. We need to think about leadership differently. We need to stop thinking that those who get power, I've got the ideas, and if I'm just going to, I'm going to make you do my ideas, and you're going to get better. To, to, to actually embracing the use of, of policy in a different way to enable the kind of learning to improve uh, to happen in schools. And yes, there's accountability, but I want to, I want to know what you're working on, uh, what you think you learned from it. If it didn't work, what you're going to do next and how you go about how we create this kind of capability in schools and in groups of people working together. That's, that's the kind of accountability that makes organizations work. And if we want these kinds of outcomes for all of our children, that's what policy has to think about. How does it enable rather than command? So um, three quick points. If I say the word seed, I would suspect that people in Washington believe it is spelled C-E-D-E. -E. And when I think about <laughs> seed, I think about it as S-E-E-D. -E um, and I think that that is the problem we, part of the problem we have, which is we are living in the new iteration of the regulatory factory model environment, which is that we are actually um, not focused on a lot of data, but focus on one or two or three pieces of data that is, that is actually doing exactly what it was intended to do, which is basically control schools as, as if they were factories as opposed to communities. Even in this situation, and, and frankly, this situation is creating a lot of agita and a lot of stress, and we are um, putting out a survey tomorrow of about 30,000 um, people who, who, who filled out this 20 or 40 minute survey that essentially shows that despite the fact that people want to stay in our profession, a lot of people feel very, very stressed, including, let me just give you one, um, one of the factoids. 73% feel like their work is very stressful. 96% of those who, it was a voluntary survey, we were asking NIOSH and the Department of Education to do a scientific one. 96% are physically and emotionally exhausted at the end of the day. 87% say the demands of their jobs interfere with their family life. Now, then you 
look at um, even districts that are really working. So you look at places like the New York Performance Standards Consortium, where there's real focus on project-based instruction, and where you see for what is a disproportionately um, uh, high-achieving, high-poverty student force, um, that what has happened is that the rate of sustainability in college is about 93% for kids who go to four-year colleges and 84% for kids who go to two-year colleges. So something is going on in those schools which are collaborative and project-based that actually is defying the odds and getting us the outcomes we want. And then you look at a place um, in your neck of the woods like ABC School District which actually has been practicing the kinds of things that Tony has talked about for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and what they're now seeing is a huge difference in a positive direction on all the outcomes that currently count because of the collaborative mm -hmm. work that is now really seeping in, seeding in schools. So, uh, since you did three, I'll do three. <laughs> My f uh, so you, you cited Durkheim which is hilarious to me. Um, <laughs> so I'll come back with Socrates. <laughs> um, and in a very Socratic fashion, I'll just ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's- Only it's at a, Harvard. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Socratic question, so I don't actually expect you to answer. Um, and, and, and the question is, is what's the alternative? Right? Um, I refuse to mortgage away public education and these schools in my neighborhood and in neighborhoods like mine around the country um, to folks that are not from my community, don't live in my community, and frankly, don't give a shit about my community. Right? I, I just refuse to, th those are our schools, right? Those are my sons that I'm sending to this place. I'm not gonna debate with you, right, over the fact that these things need to happen because those are my sons, right? And, and, and I'm clear about the fact in my community that th getting this right is life and death. I mean, nowhere is this more true, right, than communities like East Oakland, right, where the homicide rate is, is as steady as the pulse, right? And, and, and there's a huge connection between bodies dropping on my block and the continued failure to have a fundamental rethink about the role of schools in communities like East Oakland. The second thing I wanna, and, and so for me that, that connects to my, my second point, which is my favorite Malcolm X quote. Okay, so you cite Durkheim, I cite Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm famously said, only a fool would let his enemy educate his children. Right? And, and I think that we've, we've been foolish by, right, and, and I'm not sort of pointing my finger at any particular individual and saying you're my enemy, right? But I think that the, the, the ways in which we've constructed s schooling in this country um, is enemy-like, okay? Uh, in that you've got decades of entrenched failure for the exact same group of kids. Everybody knows, everybody in this country knows. It is the worst kept secret, right? And yet there is no, serious fundamental rethink, right? And to me, right, that's enemy status, right? When you, when the lives of some children matter less than the lives of others, right? That, that is the thinking of my enemy, right? And, and so again, like I'm not gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to press, right, in this way, even though what you've said, the critique is very true, okay? But I'm in schools every day. And while that is true, um, I'll end with, probably my favorite Cherokee proverb. So this, and it's actually one of my students who gave this to me, um, one of my high school kids from East Oakland. And, and he's, he gives me this, this proverb, and the, the story goes something like this, that this boy uh, is uh, sitting with um, his abuelita, his, his grandmother. And he says to his, his abuelita, he says, I feel like there's a battle going on in my head. And she says, there is. And she, he says, well, who's fighting? And she says, the two wolves. And she says, well, it, the, the boy says, well, who are they? And she says, well, one wolf is avarice and greed and selfishness. And the other wolf is joy and community 
and love and collectivity. And the boy says to his abuelita, well, who wins? And she says, the one you feed. <laughs> and so I want to continue to feed this viable alternative model, even though the reality isn't there yet. We have to keep saying okay, that this is not exactly what you said. This is not some big, distant reach for us. Okay? This is within our grasp, and we have to keep pounding on it in that way to make it a reality. Well said. And I'm very glad it was a rhetorical question. You didn't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, it's time to open it up for questions. We got a microphone over there. We got a microphone over here. Uh, I see people already uh, moving quickly to the microphones. Before we go to the microphones, let's just take a minute or two to just turn to your neighbor and just process a little bit of what you've been hearing and just talk for a minute or two. And then we'll come back together and take some questions. I only said that because I can't remember. All right, I think we're ready to take some questions. Hi, uh, my name is Sterling. I'm a graduating master's student, soon to be doctoral student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I wanna thank all three of you for a fantastically insightful and dope panel. Uh, I'm glad that Jeff used the word dope. It's an adjective to describe teachers that is not used frequently enough inside of Asquith Hall. So earlier in the discussion, you talked about the purpose of schooling and the importance of having a conversation and a discussion about what that might be. I'm wondering if you could each in turn, in maybe like one or two sentences, describe what you think the purpose of public education in our country should be. Um, and bonus points for Tony and Randy if you're able to use the word dope in that. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to use the word dope because if I use the word dope in my um, in what I was saying, 
then it would be tweeted as I had just said dope. <laughs> you just said dope three times. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I can just imagine what the <laughs> tweets are going to be about my saying the word dope. <laughs> but um, all teasing aside, I, I forgot to bring them with me today, and I rue the day that I, I rue this. But we are, our whole union is focused on reclaiming the promise of public education, not as it is today, not as it was years ago, because the whole stain of bigotry and um, segregation is something that is really important for us to not only talk about and teach about, but us to internalize, saying that as a white woman. Um, but how it needs to be for us to help all kids um, reach, and I hate using the word God-given potential, but to, to seize their opportunities and to seize their dreams. And so it may look different for different kids, but so we, you know, I normally walk around with these solution cards um, that talk about how to reclaim the promise of public education. And I think we need to actually do three very basic things. We need to focus on, um, on capacity building of our teaching force. We need to focus on instruction um, and, and the rigor of instruction. But we also need to do what Jeff was saying, we need to build communities including wraparound services and things like that, because mm -hmm. schools, bricks and mortar schools, need to be the center of communities and need to be places where people have agency, parents, families, communities, and most importantly, kids. Other thoughts on the purpose of education? You want to come up? Um, you gave us two sentences, as I recall. Um, I did run-ons. Uh, <laughs> Semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. I mean, education should uh, should form us to have a for a productive personal life. It should, uh, it should prepare us for vocation, the kind of work we might do. Um, it should instill in us a, a civic responsibility. You know, in a society where only is as good as the social intelligence we exhibit as a people. Um, and it should strengthen the way we interact with one another to create a, and sustain a convivial society. It's ultimately, it's got to be more than just about me or you. It's about how we live together to create a commons that, that we all want to live in. The purpose of education is not to escape poverty. The purpose of education is to end it. Two sentences. <laughs> Thank you. There was Socrates. That's good. Hi, I'm uh, Patty Nolan, one of those local policymakers you all probably don't like because we sometimes set policy. And I serve on the local school committee here in Cambridge. And I will tell you, I've learned a lot that I'll bring back, like ask about 10 in SML, and I would love to have those 52 themes used in our teacher evaluation. I can promise they'll be asked. I can't promise anything will happen. My question is, it seems to me transforming teachers, picking up on some of the themes that you talked about, one incredible way to do it would be for us to use the student feedbacks. There's lots of districts that are now using student feedback to help teachers better understand if their practice is actually getting through to the kids. I see principals as the key to either uh, using the PD for teachers, evaluating the teachers, really key players in this um, task to try to transform teaching into a profession that's not only respected but effective across the board. So the question is, do you know any district-wide efforts to incorporate student and peer-to-peer -peer teaching 360 reviews of other teachers? Because I can tell you, go into any school and ask the teachers who the best teachers are to get to that two or three percent, 95 percent are either there or on the journey to real effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And similarly, to use teachers to evaluate principals so that principals can get really solid feedback on how it is they can improve their practice and change in order to ensure that they're the best leaders for their, for their um, staff. Or would we be the first district to do that? <laughs> 
Uh, I'll jump in here real quickly. Um, and first of all, I just want to say that I don't dislike policymakers at all. I dislike your policies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have concrete evidence that that is true because I married a policymaker. <laughs> So we just have policy all over my house, none of which I agree with. <laughs> um, the two wolves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm losing, I'm losing. <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't know any districts um, that are doing it district-wide. And what I, one of the things I would caution you ag against is, is actually going after that. Right? I think that's one of the mistakes we make. Right, when we think about systems change, is that we continue to sort of ignore David Tyak's warning against the one best system. Okay? That, and that was kind of my earlier point, right? That it needs to be context specific. And so I think you can have like a district level policy right, about the need for variance right, across the district. So, um, so I don't know any any district that is doing it district-wide, but there are, there are a number of districts that, that are partnering with us around 10, and the, the approach that they've taken is, um, and I think this is right, is to start with the groups that, that want to do that work, that want to lead that work, okay, and let them really champion it. I think if you, if you rain down policy, again, like we're going to do this district-wide, I'm telling you right now as a teacher, I'm a bucket. Okay? Just off top, I'm a bucket because you're not asking me, right? You're doing to me again, right? So I think that what I would suggest, if you want to use 10 in your district, is to let's start by saying who wants to use, right, that approach in your district. And then teacher to teacher, if you've got teachers advocating for something to other teachers, the uptake is quick, okay? And so I think when you think about making policy, think about making policy that teachers really own, and then they'll run the policy right to their peers, and you'll get a lot quicker and higher level buy-in over time. Um, but you won't have that neat kind of blanket that you can report out in a slideshow about we're doing this district-wide. What I meant was just 360 review for principals and teachers, including teacher to teacher. That was the. There's um, um, was the uh, There's very so. There's, you know, there's. There's a lot of us who have pushed for kind of 360 accountability systems. Um, I would say that one of the worst things that have happened in the last eight years in terms of accountability on a national level is how rudimentary it's, it's become. And that the robustness that we actually need in terms of having lots of different measures. Um, Lily, I see Becky Pringle here. Lily Eskelson also often talks about the account, the opportunity dashboard. Yeah. Linda Darling Hammond and I have talked about like a very robust accountability system, which we've written about together and she's written about a lot. Um, but the whole notion of kind of reciprocal responsibility with respect to um, your professional staff is something that we've talked about a lot. But I give you two words or one saying low stakes. The moment these things mm -hmm. become high, high stakes, stakes, it's the moment that they change. Yeah. And it's the same for um, surveys. I mean, I, I was a high school teacher for six years in Brooklyn. I used to love pouring over the surveys I asked my kids to mm -hmm. fill out at the end of the course. I learned a lot from them, but they were low stakes. They were my surveys of my kids. If you, the moment you ask teachers to instead of doing feedback with each other, but to start evaluating, and if it's not in a very, very organized peer review mm -hmm. system, is the moment it's gonna be the death of We got about 10 minutes left, so just let's try to keep the, both the questions and the answers uh, modest. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, thank you for the um, session. So I wanted to ask you in terms of um, j just individual teaching, um, what do you think is, is, is more important in terms of creating great teachers? Is it more about um, having a set of rules and having a set of sort of things that, of principles or things where you say, this is what great teachers can do versus finding the right teachers and finding the right people um, to go do it and letting them use their instincts and kind of developing and, and growing them and but, but letting people do, letting kind of people, letting the teachers figure out instinctively what makes sense to them? 
I started it. I just can't. Yeah. <laughs> so I think instinctually, to be a great teacher, you want to you have to love kids and want to make a difference in the lives of kids. But frankly, if that's where it ends, mm -hmm. this is a this is both an art and a science. science. And, 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 and there's a lot of things that we need to learn. So it's not just, so you know, we've gone through different waves. We've gone through the content wave, that all you need to know is you need your, to know your content. And we've also gone through the pedagogy wave, of all you need to know is you need to know the tools of the trade. This is a profession. We also need to know our kids. We need to be part of our kids. We need to be part of our communities. We need to bleed for our kids, which most of us do, but we also need, as John was talking about, a system to allow us to do what we want and need to do for our kids. And so it's a lot of these things together. It can't simply be that you're Mother Teresa. <laughs> we need three million people who inspire and who connect and who love kids and who know their content and who are diverse and who know the pedagogy and who actually really want to work in teams to help build a future. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead. Hi, so I'm Aubrey, I'm a graduating master's candidate and I as I sat here and I listened to the conversation that we had about context, I felt like it was rich and, um, and not repetitive, but very kind of in keeping with, with some of the things we've talked about in a lot of my classes. And so I'm left wondering, why are we still talking about scale? Um, so I guess that m part of answering that might be, what does scale mean to you guys in this context of talking about preparing teachers? But I just, when we talk about context being so crucial and context being so different, it doesn't always connect to me why you're then talking about scale all the time. Yeah. Good, good question. Um, when I was still in, in Chicago and we'd been doing the work for a while and one of the laments that we routinely heard was that, uh, well, these colleges of education, they, don't, they can't prepare teachers to teach our kids to read. What are they, what are they doing? And um, at that point, we were working with schools on, uh, on the south and west side of Chicago. You know, Chicago, these are 100% African-American neighborhoods. Virtually every school is 100% low-income students. And so we set about the task of we were going to reinvent how to prepare and support teachers to succeed in teaching reading in these communities. So we started with, that's the problem we want to solve, and to, and to stay in teaching. Mm -hmm. So working back from that, what would you do? So rather than, you know, we typically divide the curriculum up, you get so many hours of this and so many hours of that and so many hours of the other. Well, if you're talking about teachers, K to two, K to three, approximately half of the time they spent is broadly speaking around literacy. So if you can't do everything, which you can't possibly do within the constraints of, of the traditional teacher preparation program, you can't possibly address all the standards. Figure <laughs> out which is the most important one to go after and really work on it. And since we were working on preparing teachers to teach in a place, part of it was spending time in, that, in those communities. They didn't know exactly which school they were going to be in, but they were going to be on the south side or the west side of Chicago. You should have an experience in the community. You should be able to see the students and their families in other ways than just the way we tend to see them when they show up inside the school building because you actually begin to see that they have extraordinary talent. You begin to appreciate more about their lives. And these are the, these are the children and the families we need to connect to. So you, you think about building a preparation program in a very different way right. when, you, when you contextualize it. It's, it's about mm -hmm. teaching literacy, in our case, teaching literacy in the context of a comprehensive literacy system, and it's about doing it in a place. Uh, that, that reshapes the way you go about what are you going to do with the limited amount of time you've got. 
because time is the, I mean, time is the scarcest resource in education, and yet we hardly ever attend to it. Right. Uh, I mean, we just, we think these ideas are good and therefore people should just do them. Uh, I, I gotta do a slight rant on, on, teacher, uh, on teacher evaluation. So the, these new teacher evaluation systems that some states develop, uh, they, because it was gotta be a process that could generate data that could be used for firing someone, what might have been a 30 minute process now often became a four hour process because of all the documentation that had to be done. And then we'd have a regulation that said, well, you got to, only principals can do this and it has to be done four times a year for every teacher in your school. Well, you know, I don't even have to put this out in the field. I can just, you know, a typical school with 40 teachers, I just took a third of your time. Mm -hmm. Where is it supposed to come from? Mm -hmm. And yet nobody asked that question. I mean, we simply don't recognize that time is the most scarce resource. And so, I mean, so that in the work we're doing now in improvement, I'm thinking about, well, can I get two minutes of, of classroom time to introduce something? I mean, you, you literally start to think about it in these kind of very small chunks once you start to realize that this is your scarcest resource, time. I, I want to just add one more thing there. That my favorite Emerson quote is, Imitation is always suicide. Right? And when you talk about, I, I think you're right to have concerns about scalability, but don't confuse scalability with imitation or copy, right? If there are things that we can scale, right? There are a set of practices. So, so I don't know where you're gonna teach, right? But if you came to East Oakland, right? I could put you in a set of classrooms with really skilled teachers where you could learn a lot Okay, that you could take away and then apply in Boston, right? So I don't know if that's scalability or not. In my mind, it, it, it kind of is, right? But don't, I think you're, the concern that you're raising, which I also have, is this idea that, well, that worked in East Oakland. So we should just do that same thing in Boston because they have black and Latino kids too, okay? And, and so I think you're right to raise that, but, but but don't lose track of the fact that there are some things that we can say with a high level of certainty, these things really matter, okay? And, exactly. and then you have to ground truth then, that in the context yeah. where you're doing the work. Yep. So think about it as not replicability, but strategies that as you tailor them mm -hmm. um, can work, have a degree of, 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 of effectiveness in other places, but you have to tailor them exactly. to your own Very needs. True. Um, and I just want to point out that last question was also getting a lot of love on Twitter. So a, a lot of people are interested in thinking about this question of context and scale. All right, we have, uh, sadly, we have time for only one more question. I think you were uh, there first, so uh, go for it. Yeah. Uh, ben Jackson, I work for TNTP, and I, I'm wondering if part of the issue here, I mean, we talked a lot about the, the need for additional support, the consideration of context, which I think is all right, but I, I worry that we're thinking about this and trying to solve this problem while still holding in our mind this largely industrial area, era constru construction of what a teacher role is. So are we doing enough to actually rethink what the role of the teacher is or should be, and how can that help us solve the problem? Well, w one of the things that I, mean, I, I sometimes describe as the problem of invisible complexity. We keep adding things to what we expect teachers to do. And, uh, and each piece seems perfectly sensible. Mm -hmm. But when you stand back and say, what is this role now mm -hmm. that we're actually asking people to execute, mm -hmm. it's incredibly complex. I mean, my simple example, when, when I was in elementary school, common reading practice was uh, round robin reading. You know, you each read from a basal reader a few sentences and then Randy read a few and then Jeff read a few and the teacher kind of stood up there in the front of the room and if you, you know, if you got something wrong, she corrected you. Just take that and put that up against what we would now expect a skilled teacher to do in reading instruction. And I, you know, I could say the same thing about mathematics or science. It, the work, it, the task of teaching that we now expect people to do are much more complex than ever before. And the organization in which they work is now much more complex than ever before. So 
as a kind of organizational sociologist, you, you pay attention to two things, the complexity of the task and the complexity of the organization in which those tasks are executed. Mm -hmm. We have made the work of teaching much harder. With and much less support. And with less support, without recognizing what we've actually done because, it, well, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you put that frog in the pot and you slowly, <laughs> you know, you raise the temperature and no one pays attention to it, and, but the frog would jump out if the water were really hot. Well, we've been slowly raising the temperature for decades on what we expect teachers to do without actually recognizing we have, we have not built the structures around this in which most people can actually succeed against these very rising a aspirations that we have. Just one quick thought on your question in closing. I was at a meeting a few years ago with Greg Gunn, who some of you know, uh, an engineer and physicist by training who got interested in education. And he, we were having some discussion around these topics and he looked at us and he said, you know, you're the only field I know of where, you know, you say that you have a job that's too difficult for three million people to do and so you just look for sort of more super people. In any other profession, you would redesign the job in a way that right, made it exactly. more possible for more people to do uh, more of the time. Um, um, okay, so uh, with that, uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for coming. And one more quick round of applause for the panelists, particularly for Jeff for introducing some new language to our all that stage. Go to your finals. <laughs>